Good evening. Welcome to the inaugural Chairs Community Forum. My name is Doug Eglinton. I'm Chair of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce. I'm excited to welcome you as we broadcast from Howard Ironworks, a hidden gem in our community. Howard Ironworks is a printing museum and restoration company. The Chairs Community Forum was conceived as a forum for thought-provoking conversation. We believe the Oakville business community is comprised of innovation, forward thinkers, and adapters. Talking of forward thinkers, I would like to compliment Drew Redden, President of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, and Franz Fournier, the Vice President. These two folk and the amazing team of six staff arrange and organize a variety of functions each year, all to help foster a community and business awareness and cohesiveness. This year, they have come up with some innovative ideas to not only keep the Oakville Chamber operating, but increase efficiencies and lower costs. We held our AGM yesterday, and the financial reports showed a small profit, even though revenue was not quite as high as previous years due to cancelled events. I am sure that our 1,000 plus members all appreciate receiving up-to-date information on all the government programs that have been launched this year. Drew and his staff unravel the sometimes complicated formulas and present it at a level that many of us small business owners can understand. Tonight, it is our pleasure to host John Stackhouse, Senior Vice President, Office of the CEO at RBC, Royal Bank. John is best known as the former editor-in-chief at the Globe and Mail, and today he advises the executive team at RBC on emerging trends in Canada's economy. And given what 2020 has brought so far, John, we are in dire need of your insight. John's presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with three of Oakville's top business leaders, Dr. Janet Morrison, President and Vice Chancellor of Sheridan College, Sam Sebastian, President and CEO of Palmerix Corporation, better known as the Weather Network, and Dean Stoney, President and CEO of Ford Motor Company of Canada. To get the evening started, I'd like to introduce a valued partner to the Oakville Chamber from RBC Royal Bank, Peter Choma, Vice President, Commercial Financial Services. Thank you, Doug, and we wish you uh, all the best as you begin your term as chair of the Oakville Chamber. It's a pleasure to be here today and to be part of this important and timely conversation. As the Vice President for Commercial Banking for RBC here in Halton South, I have the opportunity to speak with many of our region's business leaders, companies, and community members as we all face these unprecedented times. And although each of their journeys through this pandemic may look different, they all share an incredible capacity for adaptability, optimism, and ingenuity when faced with difficult times. Many leaders and business owners have seen this adversity as an opportunity to reimagine their business and now are on the path to recovery. But for the small and local businesses, the journey has been particularly difficult. The businesses that make up Canada's main streets have faced a constantly shifting environment, financial hardships, and increasing uncertainty since the early days of the pandemic. By helping local businesses, we can come through this stronger than ever and help Canada turn the corner in economic recovery. We certainly saw people across the region rally recently behind the small and local businesses during the RBC recent Canada United campaign, where we brought together 60 Canadian companies and local chambers of commerce including the Oakville Chamber, to mobilize all Canadians to shop local and support small business. In fact, almost 80% of Canadians say they're more likely to choose Canadian brands and products, demonstrate, demonstrating the reason for us to be optimistic as we start to think about the future. We do recognize and appreciate that there are still challenges ahead for you, our business community, and of course our country, and we at RBC are committed to help. We will continue to be there with advice, care, and resources that go beyond traditional banking to help our businesses and communities adapt and grow in this new environment. Our partnership with Oakville Chamber is deeply rooted in our collective desire to support local businesses, drive growth, innovation, and the development for our local economy. And it's conversations like the one we'll have today that will stimulate our thinking and move us to action. 
It is now my pleasure to introduce my RBC colleague, John Stackhouse. John, as mentioned earlier, is the Senior Vice President for the Office of the CEO. And John advises the RBC executive leadership on emerging trends in the Canadian economy. He does this through providing insights grounded on his travels across the country and around the planet. His work focuses on technological change and innovation, examining how to successfully navigate the new economy so more people can thrive in this age of disruption. Prior to joining RBC, John had spent nearly 25 years with the uh, Globe and Mail as the editor-in-chief, the editor of the Report on Business, and as a foreign correspondent in New Delhi. His fourth book, Planet Canada, was recently released on October 6th. I've had the pleasure to hear John speak on a number of times, and I can tell you that it will be informative, thought-provoking, and very insightful. Please join me in welcoming John Stackhouse. Hello, and thank you. Thank you for those kind introductions, and thank you all for spending the time to engage in what's a very unique conversation. This is actually my first time speaking at an in-person event, uh, except we're not really in person, so I'm getting my head around that. I'm here in a thinly populated uh, spot in Oakville as we all ease back into, not in, uh, into a new normal, a very different normal, but I'm so happy to be here in Oakville because it represents all that's positive in our country and in our, in our society. This community is a powerhouse in so many ways, not least because roughly 80% of the population here has a post-secondary education. That's extraordinary, and I'll speak later about why that is so critical to our recovery, uh, and our recovery can begin right here in Oakville. Now, None of us would have expected this kind of conversation six or seven months ago. In fact, I don't think many of us even anticipated this six or seven weeks ago when we thought we were edging back into a different fall than the one we are living in right now. It's just a constant reminder how this is an unprecedented crisis. And it's very humbling in a way on the question of expectations. This is certainly the most unexpected time of our lives and surely gives us a daily reminder that we always have to expect the unexpected. We've had a lot of unexpected in the, last, uh, in the last number of months. I love this sort of conversation though because it gives me a chance to pause and reflect on where we've been, but also think about where we're going, especially over the horizon. What might the, the, the distant future and the not so distant future look like? And as I think about what may, the world may look like in 2021, I just like to pause and reflect on the world six months ago and what our expectations were at that point in time and what we might have done differently as business leaders, as decision makers, had we known then what we know now. I certainly, among other things, would have bought Apple shares. They've doubled in value over the last six months. And that's not a fluke uh, when now with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, people at the time said, no one's gonna buy smartphones, not expensive ones, not during a recession. And yet we did. We did because we all had a lot more time to spend on our phones. They became even more coveted uh, devices for all those new pursuits like Zoom or these sorts of conversations. We all needed new accessories. I'm on my second uh, pair of earbuds. I suspect that won't be my, uh, my, my last one. We also found new purposes for our phones as healthcare devices, among other, other things. So we're turning to technology for all sorts of new things in our daily lives. And we also had surplus savings or at least savings to switch uh, to different po po points of consumption. And that's what I'll try to focus on tonight because despite all the challenges around us and we can get consumed in the negativity of the current in environment, there are all sorts of opportunities for the innovator, for the, the, for the business decision maker who's willing to make a cor courageous bet where maybe others want to, uh, want to shy away. All sorts of expectations have been defied over the last number of months We've been spending collectively as Canadians actually more over the last few months than we did a year earlier. So while we went into hiding or hibernation in a way in the spring, we actually came out in summer. We spent two and a half times more on golf this summer than the previous summer. If you tried to get on a golf course, you understand what was going on there. So people were eager to do things. Human nature did not change because of this crisis. Of course, the way we spent or the things that we spent on did change. 
And that's where the opportunity is for the innovators in our communities. Now, I don't deny for a moment that the next six months are going to be as challenging as the last six, but in very different ways. The economy is in a very slow recovery. This is a slow-mo uh, recovery, slow motion with uh, slow momentum. It will be a grind. Uh, we've got slow global trade growth. We've got a slow global economy. Here in Canada, we're going to have limited immigration for a while, and that was a big driver of economic growth right across the country. And investors will remain cautious. The public will be more agitated. If you're an employer, your workforce may be more agitated too. We may move from a stage of anxiety to anger, from fear to loathing, and we have to be prepared for that. This is an unsettling time for all of us as humans. So we have to engage in conversations to at least address those fears honestly, transparently, and transparently. Social contracts will be challenged. In all of our organizations, we have formal legal contracts, but we also have social contracts with our consumers, with our employees, with our neighbors, with people we call stakeholders. And we have to constantly be thinking about those contracts and how they're being tested anew by this crisis and have those honest conversations with our stakeholders, be they employees or shareholders or neighbors or suppliers and customers about what they're expecting from us. And we're all gonna be challenged to find new business models, hybrid models. We talk a lot about the hybrid car. We're gonna have hybrid business models all around us. We're not gonna live in a binary world where it's gonna be all digital, all online, or all analog. We know as consumers, we know as citizens, we want a bit of both. We know our employees want a bit of both. We know our consumers want a bit of both. That's a terrific opportunity if you're in both arenas, but it can be more expensive. It can be more challenging to scale. It may be more challenging to compete with ones who can focus only on one of those arenas. But through those challenges, we'll all become better business operators and we'll be challenged to innovate when we question how we're doing things differently. We're going to experiment with what we call the hybrid hustle in everything we do. And with that in mind, I wanna to turn to the report we've just published at uh, RBC through our thought leadership group. It's called After the Crisis, Eight Ways COVID Will Transform the Economy and Disrupt Every Business. So let me walk through those eight trends and then we'll turn it over to a terrific panel conversation. Trend number one is how we work. It's the BTO battle, not Backman Turner Overdrive for those of you of a certain age. It's the back to office battle. Should we go back to the office or stay away? This spring was phenomenal. Five million or more than five million Canadians worked remotely, moved to a remote working environment in a matter of days. Extraordinary that collectively we pulled that off as a country. Now we're gonna have to pull off something as challenging but the challenges will be different. We're starting to hear from lots of business leaders, particularly in the United States, that there may be a productivity challenge. They're saying that this new model of distributed work doesn't really work for the long-term productivity or efficiency of an organization. Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, was asked by the Wall Street Journal, what are the advantages to people working at home? And he said, none, there are no advantages. We had a session this week with senior Apple executives and talked about the same challenges. And they've got people working all over the world remotely. And you'd think they'd be very good and comfortable with it, which they are. But they feel, they miss collaboration. They miss serendipity. They miss those collisions in the hallways, in the offices, the whiteboard, literal, literally whiteboard sessions that, that, that allow them to flourish as an innovator. A recent OECD report said there is a sweet spot between teleworking and in-office working. And we've probably gone beyond that sweet spot in many organizations. And we're gonna have to figure our way back to a comfortable middle. And we're gonna have to balance needs as employers or as organizations and the needs and desires, legitimate desires of our employees. Roughly half of Canadians currently working from home anticipate splitting their time between home and office. Many of those want to work predominantly at home. Slack, the um, the technology company did a survey of knowledge workers and 72% of them said they want a blended in-office and remote work approach. But another survey found that half of Canadian employers feel they do not have the technology or the aptitude even to manage both a distributed uh, workplace and a centralized one. 
So we're going to have to invest a lot more in technology as employers over the coming years. But with technology, those skills that are critical, because technology on its own is pretty useless. It needs humans, humans to make the technology flourish. Which, take, which takes me to trend number two, which is how we shop. We all know this as consumers. We know e-commerce is, is exploding, and that's nothing new. It's been around for a quarter century. But how we shop online is also going through a fascinating change through this crisis. In the US, two thirds of shoppers bought online for the first time, and over half are spending more online. We're not going back. We've set standards here, established habits that are not going to change e easily. But it's not just shopping online. Increasingly, we're going curbside. It's better for merchants and easier for consumers as we want to get out of our bunkers, as we're moving around our communities. Buy online, pick up in stores, uh, BOPIS or B-O-P-I-S, accounted for 42% of total orders in June. That was up from 21% a year earlier, so it doubled uh, in, in, uh, in its share. In late June, two-thirds of Canadian consumers said they placed an online order for delivery, and nearly half placed an online order for pickup. More than 20% of Canadian shoppers said they made a click-and-collect purchase for the first time. 20% did this for the first time in June. So what does this mean? Well, it means for all of us who are in a consumer-facing business, but especially for merchants and for retailers, you've got to find a way to get in front of consumers when they are nowhere near you physically. Of course, that means digital channels. You have to get into their pathway before someone else does and guides them to a different place for the, uh, for the purchase decision. Secondly, we as businesses really need to incorporate hybrid models integrating online services, including transactions and payments, with physical services, like that pickup service or delivery, and service itself. And then thirdly, brand loyalty. Brand loyalty is in play. This is an enormous opportunity, a threat, of course, as well. But brand loyalty is in play. In the US, over half of the shoppers who made purchases online did so from a, red, a web retailer they had never used before. We are all dealing with retailers and product creators who we may not have known of or certainly had contact with a year ago. 80% of those buyers who had found new uh, online retailers said they plan to continue to deal with them. So brand loyalty is in play. And if you're willing to go after that, that's an enormous growth opportunity. Which takes me to trend number three, which is how we watch, how we entertain ourselves. Of course, another trend that we all are familiar with. It was the season of binging. For me, it was a little too much Ozark, The Crown, and World War II in color, all on Netflix. And yeah, that's uh, pretty typical, at least in terms of the choice of platform. The big five, which is Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Amazon, and Disney+, Plus, account for 80% of our streaming. So what we're consuming is dominated by those platforms. That is great for a lot of content creators in every corner of the world. They are creating extraordinary stories that they can share with people all over the planet through those platforms. That's, a, that's an enormous opportunity for artists in a community like Oakville who can now reach global audiences that they might not have gotten to before. But what about all those culture groups or artist, uh, artist groups that rely on physical connection that maybe are not comfortable or don't have the tools to get onto those platforms? They're losing patrons. They're losing money as we speak and our communities are weakened as a result. We need local artists, we need local culture. Again, a moment of transformation. We have to help our content creators, our storytellers, our artists, all of our cultural institutions find ways to thrive on those platforms because that's where the consumers are. And it's not simply taking a video and putting it onto a platform. Increasingly, the content creators that we're seeing thrive are creating immersive, and interactive experiencing. Gaming is going through the roof, especially for uh, those who are under the age of 35, and artists are taking advantage of this. The singer uh, Travis Scott put a, uh, uh, he's, he's a star on Fortnite uh, uh, video games. He put one of his concerts inside a video game and attracted 12 million viewers. Gives you a signal of where the future of culture may be going, and certainly the future of entertainment. We're just at the beginning of a revolution in content, which will become more immersive, more interactive, and certainly more social. Which takes me to trend number four, which is how we share. 
we are all sharing uh, like maniacs in some ways a little too much, getting things sent to us and sharing them with, uh, with our networks as quickly as we can. And this in a way may be the most important trend because this is about society. This is about communities that are becoming digital and virtual communities, which uh, shapes everything else that uh, we do. We are seeing massive growth. Hard to believe that global internet traffic increased 40%, 40% in the first three months of the pandemic. I think we're all uh, guilty of that. Data creation is on course to grow tenfold between 2017 and 2025. We are in the midst of an explosion of data and we're just at the beginning in a, in a, or closer to the beginning of that explosion than we are to the end. This is leading to a mass, massive concentration that we're seeing globally. This is dominated by a number, a small number of firms that control or at least channel most of, uh, most of our data. And that creates both an opportunity and a challenge for the rest of us who, uh, who uh, rely on them. And we're seeing massive risks. With that increase in traffic, we are seeing an equal or greater increase in attacks, in criminal efforts to take advantage of that. Active phishing sites went up 350% between January and March in this year as we all started to share uh, more data and became more vulnerable. So what does this mean? Well, certainly a greater demand for data services and data strategies. If your organization does not have a data strategy, today is the day uh, to get going on it because uh, tomorrow will be a day too late for it. We all need data strategies because the success of our organizations, whether you're a public service organization, a non-profit or a corporation, will thrive on data. We need to think much more about connectivity, about the internet of things. How are we connected beyond just the sharing of, 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 of data beyond software with our consumers, but with all our stakeholders? Collectively, we're going to have to invest a lot more in bandwidth. This crisis has opened our eyes just a little bit to the challenges that await us if we do not make those investments. And if you've been in rural communities or know people who are in remote communities in this country, you know the challenge and how quickly they will be decades behind much of the world if we do not invest in their uh, bandwidth capabilities. And we'll also have to develop more and more flexible approaches to privacy, to balance safeguards. Of course, we care about that as Canadians, but also to allow for innovation to allow us to continue to develop the products, services, and platforms that we know we need to thrive in the 2020s and beyond. Trend number five is how we travel. We're not sitting in our basements, sharing, uh, watching Netflix and uh, sharing uh, Facebook uh, uh, comments with our friends. We're doing much more than that. We're human. We're human. We like to get out. We like to explore. We like to see new things. We like to encounter new people and experience new experiences. This crisis could not crush that. So as we open up, we're going to see more travel, but it will be a different travel. We're not going to get on long haul flights in big numbers anytime soon. Unfortunately, we're gonna become a little bit more disconnected from the world. Just listen to our podcast on RBC called The 10 Minute Take. You can search for it, The 10 Minute Take. And the most recent episode is with our capital markets analyst, Walter Spracklin, who talks about the turbulence ahead and the five years of recovery that will probably be needed for airlines. Canadians say we are significantly less likely to travel to other provinces even, not, not, let alone other countries. And we're gonna to wanna to drive a lot more than fly uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, while. We're going to shy away from cruise ships, from big resorts, but we wanna get out. We want new experiences. And that's why this summer we saw an explosion in local travel. Airbnb, which many people wrote off in March, actually had some of its best weeks ever in the crisis because people wanted to get out and they used Airbnb to go within 50, a 50 mile radius, a uh, 50 kilometer radius of their uh, home city or hometown. As their CEO likes to say, Pittsburgh became the new Paris for them. So of course, we're gonna have more staycations and anyone who provides products, trampoline sales this summer went through the roof, same with hot tub sales and above ground pool sales. Anyone who can turn your backyard or your balcony into your castle or your playground is going to thrive for a good while. We'll have more demand for localized ex adventures and experiences. People want to get out and experience things. And maybe we can't get to Paris, but Pittsburgh's actually a pretty great place to visit. And there's equally great places to visit around us uh, here in Oakville uh, and an opportunity there for communities 
uh, as well as service providers to create those experiences. And the road trip, of course, is back and uh, will allow us to get out and see places that we might have flown over uh, before. Trend number six is how we heal. This is a healthcare crisis, more than an economic crisis, and it's a profound economic crisis. But this crisis is maybe helping us heal a bit differently and maybe heal better as we come out of this crisis. And there will be more health threats, even if we get a vaccine uh, in, our, in our lifetime. So we have to figure out how to heal better and we can learn from this crisis. Public health security is the dominant concern across the country. People do not want to risk their health, nor should they. But because of that, we're becoming much more comfortable with technologies that maybe we shied away from a year ago. We're much more comfortable with video conferences with our physicians or with telemedicine, with telehealth. Doctors, nurses, and health administrators are becoming more comfortable with, uh, with those platforms. And as we look into the future, we anticipate a lot more technology that will allow us both to uh, treat ourselves but diagnose our symptoms where we are at home in a healthier and safer environment. We became comfortable with lots of new te screening technologies after 9-11. The same sort of seismic shift will take place in health technologies in the years ahead that will allow us to use the power of technology to ensure our safety. We've also discovered the need to invest in elder care, which we've seen tragically exposed over the last few months. And there are much better ways to go about caring for our seniors than we have, and technology will be critical to that. Which takes me to trend number seven, because it echoes many of those lessons from how we heal, which is how we learn. The same forces are at play in some ways. As we look around the world and study what's going on in education, we're seeing less exchange of students, obviously fewer international students, but a growing comfort with technologies for learning and that blended model that I spoke about at the beginning where students and teachers and education professionals are becoming more and more comfortable. It's challenging, it's expensive, it can be frustrating in the initial weeks and months, but we know that's where the future is going, where technology is not just a convenience, it is a powerful way to help us personalize services so that we can start to ensure that education is delivered at the speed of the student, not just at the speed of the teacher or the speed of the class or the collective. And that's extraordinary. It's the next Netflix idea when that is uh, uh, added, to, uh, added to education. And that takes me to our last trend, which is maybe in some ways the most challenging, especially for an internationally minded community like Oakville, which is how we trade. As a trading nation, we have to be concerned about this because we as Canadians, we need more trade. We need a lot more trade to recover. We need more of the world trading. And we need to see trade as much more than manufactured goods and resources. Trade in the 2020s and 2030s is going to thrive on intellectual property. It's going to thrive on knowledge as well as manufactured good and goods and resources. But that brain power, which comes from those skills that we see growing and thriving in communities like Oakville, will be essential to our success as a trading nation. So as we see trade challenged in the coming months and perhaps years, as we see more disputes coming at us, uh, it's easy to, to, uh, to uh, sh shrivel up and back away. We as Canadians need to lean into this and say to the world, you need more of us and we need more of you. And it's not just our resources or the great things that we make, you need our brain power, our ideas on those uh, platforms especially that, that I talked about. And we as Canadians are going to have to pull together because we're a small country of 40 million people on a planet of 8 billion. But the world will value what, uh, what we have to offer. And the more we can get that into the world, the stronger our recovery will, uh, will, will, will be. So let me say in conclusion that this pandemic has been humbling. It's been tragic and it's been challenging for us all in very different ways. But it can also be liberating when we learn from the changes going on around us, when we seize on the technology that we're all relying on more and more and more to innovate, to create better services and better products and better experiences for each other, to become more competitive globally. We can see that a recovery is not just stronger, but is more resilient and is more sustainable and more equitable for Canadians across the country. And it can grow right here 
from Oakville. But we have to understand that this pandemic has disrupted every business in ways, in more ways perhaps than we can appreciate. We have to understand as well that a critical, critical common thread is the idea of distributed activity. Most of us grew up in centralized environments, schools, factories, offices, hospitals, malls. And much of the activity that we used to centralize for, for efficiency reasons has been distributed. And it's not going to come back easily. It's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Technology, in some ways, is taking care of that efficiency question. And people are saying they're voting with their feet whether it's employees or consumers, that they want that distributed model as well as the in-person model. And the longer this goes on, we know this, the more habits become embedded in all of us. So we can't count on them changing. Our expectations actually have to change because the habits out there uh, in, in our communities and in our society are changing. But we also have to appreciate the more we disconnect from each other, from coworkers, from customers, from neighbors, the more we're at risk of losing our ability to create and collaborate, to work together, to innovate. Those are the skills that are the winning skills for the 2020s. So the challenge is now on and it's game on for us to find ways to bring those great human skills back into our business and community models and know that the expectations that we all take to work and we take home every day are going to be, continue to be challenged. The future will be more disrupted even than we've seen over the last six months. But for strong communities, for strong organizations that have that power of technology, as well as those great human skills to work together, those are the communities, those are the organizations that are going to thrive coming out of this crisis. Thank you all again for sharing this time with us. And I really look forward to a great conversation with our panelists. Thank you, John. I'm sure those eight COVID points will make for a very interesting discussion. MNP is proud to partner with the Oakville Chamber of Commerce for the Chairs Community Forum and other initiatives as well as participate on our board. MNP is a leading national accounting, tax and business consulting firm. They are committed to supporting Canadian business owners and communities. The firm created the MNP COVID-19 Business Advice Centre to help organisations, <coughs> excuse me, navigate the uncertainty of the current crisis. MNP continues to monitor the evolving landscape to provide up-to-date and relevant content to businesses and our communities. On behalf of our partner, MNP, I would now like to introduce our invited guests to join Mr. Stackhouse. Dr. Janet Morrison is the President and Vice-Chancellor of the Sheridan College. Janet is a lifelong learner and educator who believe in, believes in the transformative power of post-secondary education. Janet and her team are focused on developing students' capacity to thrive on change, which takes agility, self-direction, calculated risk-taking, and imagination. Dean Stoneley, President and CEO, Ford Motor Company of Canada Limited. Dean started his career with Ford in 1992 here in Canada. He returns to Oakville after serving in a variety of global leadership roles in the US, South Africa, South Korea, Japan, and China. Ford employs approximately 8,000 people in Canada. An additional 18,000 employees work in more than 400 Ford and Ford Lincoln dealerships across the country. Sam Sebastian, President and CEO of Palmrex, the Weather Network. Sam joined Palmrex in 2017, bringing his vast industry experience and expertise in the digital space. Prior to joining Palmrex, Sam held the position of Vice President and Managing Director at Google Canada. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on how the pandemic has affected your industries, education, manufacturing, and data. Thank you. Welcome back. We have three great Oakville leaders in conversation here to talk about how COVID is disrupting not only every business, but every organization in very positive as well as uh, some more challenging ways. And we'll talk about what that means in their organizations, but also how it can play out across the community. Janet, I want to start with you and focus on one of our trends in the RBC report, which is how we learn. And we're all learners. Uh, we've been in a crash course uh, in so many ways over the last six months. But you're 
at uh, one of the country's top uh, education institutions, a real pioneer, has been for decades. I wonder if you can pick one thing that you've learned about learning over the last six months that we should all carry with us as we uh, move into the future. Yeah, you know what, so much of your, uh, of your talk today resonated. Um, you know, I think we've been, as educators, thinking about this notion of enhanced volatility and uncertainty um, complexity, and, and there's been so much conversation about what that means for the future of work and the economy, uh, certainly some of RBC's earlier work on, on humans wanted and, and, and what the World Economic Forum has talked about. We've been thinking about uh, relative to learners and our obligation to position them for success. Um, and, and, you know, our strategic plan was really prescient in that way because what we heard was that students need technical skills or job ready skills, but they also need competencies. So many of the things that you talked about, creativity, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship. And, and, you know, we think we do a good job at that. Uh, what nobody saw coming was the imperative to move over 3,000 courses online, uh, literally overnight. Um, and the lesson for us is that all of the ways you talk about the world changing are actually interdependent. So to respond to the way that learners learn, we have to think differently about the way we work. We need to think differently about consumerism and what it means to be responsive uh, in a world that almost immediately went entirely online. And so the supports that we provide to learners, it wasn't just the courses, it was the supports because mental health, physical well-being, all of that needed to pivot very quickly. That meant that our talent, our workforce, uh, the people that really underpin Sheridan's commitment to excellence had to move quickly uh, in that space too. The only other thing I give you, everybody was learning. So the learners needed to pivot, but so too uh, did all of, again, the faculty and staff that make the magic happen. So uh, all the while, everything in your private world is, uh, has gone bonkers too. So uh, I think a real genuine moment of learning broadly defined. Well, the crisis is certainly, uh, it, it hasn't brought a lot of new, new uh, trends, but it's accelerated trends that we Absolutely. were seeing before, and you've just articulated to that. It didn't yeah. crush the future. It brought it, uh, it, brought it right to our, right. Our, our, our doorstep. Dean, I wonder if you can talk about one of the other trends, which is how we travel. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, where the road trip mm -hmm. is, uh, is back. That's got to have people at Ford thinking maybe differently. Uh, about the coming years, especially as we look to hopefully come out of this. It does, and the, the, the market's been quite resilient. I mean, we saw in the early days of the pandemic, clearly we were shut down, but in the last few months, uh, we're actually selling at a rate above same period last year. And uh, a lot of consumers now are exactly, they're embracing the road trip, which, which we love. Um, and I, I think something you said, John, was really important about accelerating trends that were already there. And, and I think one of the things is, you know, the, the consumers always wanted to kind of control their environment or customize their environment. We're seeing that even more now during the pandemic, that, that need for control. So us managing the data, managing the data from the car, um, tailoring the experience to the customer, everything from buying the car to how they use the car um, to, you know, we have a Ford Pass app that they can do to customize all kinds of things with their experience. And so it's really accelerated that. And although we were working on, on these things, uh, the pandemic has kind of turbocharged those efforts. And, uh, and that's exciting. I mean, that part of it is exciting because that's here to stay. And I think we're on a different trajectory now, um, which, which I think will be really exciting to, to see play out. You mentioned the key word data. And Sam, I want to uh, turn to you for that because you are, uh, in, in, you are leading a data company. It's not a, a, we talked about this before, it's a, a weather company that we all rely on every day, but it's a data company. And this has been a, uh, a data revolution and a, and a data crisis in some ways. What should we be thinking about and what should the, the, the viewers be thinking about for their own organizations in terms of data from what you've learned over the last six months? Well, you mentioned it in your, in your talk. An organization needs to have a data strategy. And along with the data strategy comes uh, complications, risks. There's all sorts of things, identifying the right stakeholders that unless you have a strategy and are, th and, and I mean, listen, I've lived in this world for a long time at Google. In the last three years, we've been really trying to transform through data. So 
we've had that strategy, we've figured out who all the stakeholders are. There are many companies who just aren't there yet, but they're now there in the last six months. And if you just, um, if you don't step back a little bit and determine uh, what am I trying to either automate or leverage through data, uh, what is the overall strategy, what do my users need, my customers need, um, how do the employees react, and, and kind of organize all of that and, and put together a plan, then you're just gonna be going after quote unquote data or big data and not really have the insight behind it. So, um, but what's exciting is for a company like ours who's constantly working with advertisers or users and lots of different stakeholders, now they understand our language a bit more because they've had to the last six or seven months. And so they're engaging with us now more than ever, looking not only just for how do you help us with our data and how do you better explain what the user is doing within our store and outside our store because you engage with, with them often because so many folks use the app. Um, but more importantly, what's the insight? What's the one or two things you can tell me about what my consumer did six, seven months ago? I know that, but the last six or seven months, I don't know what they're doing because they're not in my store. But I know, I know various different elements about them. You help kind of stitch together what's happened the last six months because we, we just don't see them nearly as much. We know they're elsewhere, they're buying online, et cetera, uh, but help us build that online, offline insight uh, and so it's exciting for us because we can re-engage with folks. It's a little scary for a lot of organizations who haven't kind of gone there yet, um, but to your point earlier, uh, it, you almost have to go there today um, uh, in order to kind of get your arms around it and begin to develop the plan. Well, maybe Janet and Dean, you can talk a bit about how you're both becoming data organ or organizations. One of the great powers of, of data is that it allows providers to personalize everything, whether it's a mass education course or a car which we may think of as a com commodity. Every Ford Escort is the same. Well, no, with data, actually each one, mine is, is mine. It's going to function differently because of the, the data that I allow it to, uh, to use, and it gets better, and I get more comfortable with it. Um, that's a big concept and hard to execute on, uh, either in the classroom or the flat factory floor, I'm sure. But Janet, help, help us understand how this crisis is helping you uh, accelerate the personalization of education, but yeah. also to harness the data that is now at uh, your fingertips and your students' fingertips. So there, there was something else that you said about um, the sweet spot, right? And so, you know, I, I always try to be clear with people that I think technology enhanced learning is the sweet spot. What happened in March was uh, emergency remote learning at all levels uh, across the system. I think what you're now seeing uh, is is quality remote learning, and um, I, you know I I have I'm on the record as, as saying that I think I hope we ultimately calibrate to a point where we use technology to enhance learning. I don't think in all instances that's online learning. Frankly, I think you know we still find power and we find engagement which drives learning in community, and we, we haven't mastered that yet in a purely uh, online environment. I don't think. Um, what I would say is that that, that dramatic and, uh, and in, in the immediate instance, abrupt shift allowed us now uh, to collect even more information that can be used, I think, to drive student success. So there's a tremendous amount of research at all levels of education, but most particularly in the post-secondary space, about the antecedents to students being successful. So we know for example, by nature of incoming grades, one input point, but we also know on personality and interest scales that help us understand sense of purpose or the efficacy of our transition efforts. When we can now use data from our learning management system, which is being used far more broadly, which gives us bigger data, we can now start to piece together what we know to be common experiences, common obstacles, uh, and common successful strategies for circumnavigating them. Uh, so I, th I think that's all positive. It's, a, it's like everything else. It's a learning continuum, right? Huge kudos to my colleagues for making, you know, I'll, I'll admit, post-secondary education is not known for turning on a dime. Uh, we're often described as Titanic-like. But in this instance, uh, we pivoted quickly, and I think we are starting to see tremendous value, including... Uh, what this particular um, 
uh, environment and context does uh, to inform and drive good research on student success, which is at the core of everything we do at Sheridan. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting when you talk, uh, you reflect back to March, a lot of people said, hi, that's the end of the school as we know it, yeah. and it's the end of the car. We, we're, you know, we don't need cars anymore, not, uh, not in big numbers, and of course things have not uh, turned out that way. But Dean, help us understand how the car is evolving through this crisis. Yeah, sure. Well, I think it starts even with the, the shopping experience. And um, I think we've been working a lot of these things with, with our dealers and, and consumers are shifting. They, they want to spend less time at a dealership. Um, they want to do more research online. All of those things have been trends that have been around for, for many, many years. We've seen that accelerate. And I think our dealers have seen that and they've embraced it. They've had to change their business doing pickup and delivery from customer homes for service, um, even delivery to, to the, their home when they buy a new car. Um, much of the transaction is done online. Uh, the whole thing can be done online, but it's a very high involvement purchase. Most people still want to visit a dealership. So we've seen this shift happen much more quickly. But, but in terms of the vehicle, I mean, there's so much data generated by vehicles. All of our vehicles we sell have modems in them. Um, they're all connected to the cloud. So they're generating immense amounts of, of data. And, and the key is putting the, the, the driver or the owner, the customer in that driver's seat, uh, mind the pun, but for, for them to control that data. Uh, and be able to, to use it. I mean, one of the things that we started before the pandemic with Amazon was the ability to have a package delivered to your car. Um, so you could unlock the car remotely. Um, you could be at the office, you could be at home, your car could be anywhere in the world, quite frankly. It wouldn't matter and you could have them, uh, put, them put, in the, put the package in their vehicle. Well, that's working really well now with the pandemic with more delivery to home. People are using that type of technology. So it's working with partners. Um, you know, it's realizing the trends and, and how we can enable the vehicle. And now the vehicles are, are connected. I mean, the sky's the limit. Over-the-air updates, um, servicing, a lot of these, these things can be done remotely. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty exciting time. And, uh, and again, I think this, this shift is just is, is pushing both the technology, but also the customer acceptance of it um, to, to use it. Sam, you've uh, watched this uh, and been part of it for, for years, and I suspect a lot of uh, business leaders and community leaders in Oakville say this is all very well and good, but ultimately I'm going to be in the hands of Google or Facebook, the platforms, uh, or you know, if I want to be a real data company, I've got to go to Waterloo or, 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 or the Valley, and you know, I suspect we'd agree that's not so. But how do organizational leaders need to get started in thinking about this? What do they need to come to grips with this to... Well, make their I mean, Oakville organization successful. I, I think it's super exciting in many ways, right? Like we've all gone through this roller coaster where the first month or two was not exciting. It was like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Then we, we kind of got our legs under us. And now I think, especially if, if you're optimistic, you're, you have an entre entrepreneurial mind, you can reimagine how you can build your workforce, retain your workforce, attract folks from almost anywhere to, to your company, uh, and uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, you're going to have to because everyone else now has these same capabilities too. And so it really becomes a test for your, your leadership, uh, but more imp importantly, your employees, your managers on, can they kind of see around that corner and imagine what can our, what can our workspace, what can our, um, how we work look differently now that we've proven it over the last six months apply it to our organization, but most importantly, to attract and retain the best talent anywhere to, uh, to move our company forward. And before, when you were, um, I mean, we've got five offices around the world, Madrid, uh, three here in, uh, in, the Toronto, uh, in Canada, and then one in the US. And we would attract employees to Oakville, but, but mostly pull from this general area. In order to get a, a really wicked engineer or data scientist, they might be in Waterloo, they might be in the Toronto area. That's, that's a tough commute. You did it today. Uh, th that doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't because uh, for sure we're going to have some uh, leverage our space to connect and brainstorm, et cetera. But there's going to be many opportunities where folks can work from wherever. Uh, and if we can give them all the various different tools and, 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 and make this our place the number one place to work, for them, uh, you can almost reimagine what your workforce is going to look like uh, and how and where you're going to do business. So I think, but, but if you don't think like that uh, very quickly, there's many other people who are all over the world and you're going to get outflanked. So it, it's, uh, 
Um, we've proven it can be done. You, you, you referenced Reed Hastings. Don't ask the CEO what he, he or she thinks about how they want to work. Ask the employees. Because the employees are like, listen, we don't want to come back. We, um, I can see my kids. I have no commute. My, my life is much more fulfilling now. Yeah, I want to connect with my, 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 my peers, et cetera, but not as much as I, I, I did before. We can craft that if we do it right, uh, and especially if we open up that engagement level with our employees. So you've just raised a fascinating leadership challenge because a lot of leaders like control. They like centralization. They see the efficiency. They get the, the, the innovation quotient. Employees see it very differently for a whole host of reasons. How are the three of you thinking this through as leaders? And what, what, what are your employees uh, telling you? Uh, we've got here three people who employ collectively, I think it's 7,200 people in Oakville. So it's a great focus group. Uh, Janet, let me start with you. We've talked about your students, but what are your employees telling you? About it, well, and, and you know, our, our employees are very generous. We've been doing, as I'm sure um, many employers are, regular pulse surveys. Uh, I, I think, uh, like the rest of us, and, and to Sam's point, their perspective has evolved. What I saw early on was near panic, and now what you see is kind of this evolving, uh, maybe more accepting mindset. Um, you know, I had the privilege of participating in a leadership forum at U of T last week. And, you know, there's, some, there's a bucket filling moment that comes uh, in, in, in a calm space to kind of sit and reflect. And I don't, I don't know about, about you all, I don't have a lot of those. I haven't had a lot of those moments since March. It seems like, I, so I think, you know, the, the, the notice for, for, for my own um, leadership practice and well-being is, is to take those moments. Um, you know, I, I've long prided myself on being a transformational leader. Um, that has shifted a little bit because the mental health and well-being of my community uh, is paramount. So there's parts of my leadership that have kind of shifted back to being more servant in, in orientation. Um, you know, we talked earlier about needing to balance. I think this moment you know, to your point, is such an amazing, it presents such amazing opportunities to actually catapult forward. But supporting people to do that, to demonstrate courage and creativity and entrepreneurship, you need to create safety and they really need to be well and uh, functioning at peak performance. And doing that while work is disrupted, home is disrupted, most of my employees have kids or they're responsible for elder care, uh, I was giving the example of, of doing a Zoom meeting with a, a young colleague in a bathroom because she lives in a multi-generational home and that's where it's quiet. Uh, I, it did give me a moment of pause to think I should go to the bathroom to get <laughs> some quiet from my teenagers. Um, but, but I think, you know, all of us need to take responsibility for being what we're telling our colleagues and what I'm telling uh, students they need to be. Nimble, flexible, adaptive, resilient but recognizing that cultivating those things uh, demands energy. And right now, people are tapped. And so uh, I, I think a lot about mental health and well-being holistically, and I try to model those things uh, for folks. Some days better than others. And we, we, we talked about the sweet spot. Are you at that sweet spot now, or how do you see, see, see things shifting? I don't know. You know what? I, uh, Dean and I were talking. I, I work from home most of the time. About 25% uh, of the learners uh, I work for are on campus. And I feel a tremendous accountability on the one hand to model working at home and doing it effectively and efficiently, but to also be present and, and, to, uh, and to demonstrate that it's safe and that we're being incredibly uh, rigorous about, uh, about what returning to campus looks like. So, um, I, I don't know what I do find. I find lots of screen time exhausting and I, you know, I'm trying to be empathetic about that too. Um, so I don't know about sweet spot yet and, and, and everything is disrupted, right? You, it, to, whether it was the case counts going up or the potential for a shift from, you know, level three to level two, or if you're connected nationally to what's happening in Quebec, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that equilibrium, the sweet spot, um, uh, is attainable now. What I'm, what I'm trying to go for is some balance. And, and again, some days better than others. Dean, you've got a very different workforce, a factory yeah. as well as uh, well, offices I do. and dealers. So so. We have place-dependent workers, which mm -hmm. would be our factories, and they're all working. Uh, but, but our factories are very regulated environments. Um, they have safety protocols, and so we really don't have any issue 
there, and, and it's, it's somewhat business as usual, obviously with an enhanced level of security. But I would say I'm somewhere in between, Jen and Sam. I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I don't think it's, I think we've made work from home work really well. I work from home. Um, we've had to respond to uh, the pandemic, and I, and I think that's been a catalyst to, to kind of leverage that equity that we have as a team, um, relationships that have been built over many, many years, and we're using that equity. I'm not sure that's sustainable forever. I'm not sure I'm well ready to say this is the new normal. Um, I think it'll be a hybrid model. I think we'll, we'll see people work from home, but I don't think it's, it'll be 100%. And, and, and I, Janet said about feeling exhausted. I, I agree. I mean, we're social creatures. I, I get energy from being around people. Um, being on Zoom calls 10 hours a day um, is not a rewarding experience for me. Now, it depends on what you do. If you're, if you're doing software engineering or you're doing spreadsheets or you're doing task-based work, being at home may be great, less distraction. But as a leader, leading a team and, and trying to inspire and innovate, and you know, now as we get into a steady state where we're not responding to the pandemic every day, we need to continue to innovate. Um, and and you know, my goal is to out-execute our competition. And we need to continually do that. And I need a really engaged team with lots of collaboration. And I would say the technology is great, but for me, it's not all the way there. You know, we, we work with our retailers. We have dealer councils. We would normally get together for days on end with strategy sessions. We're doing that remotely. We're using Bluescape and WebEx and Zoom, every piece of technology out there, but it's, it's not 100%. It's maybe 70%. Um, 70%. I would say in terms of getting the same level of engagement, collaboration, um, I, it, it's just not, not all there for me. So for us, you know, our company, the culture is, is just so important. And, and I, I, I get the remote work. I mean, we do software engineering in Oakville. We have, we have a big building in Ottawa, Waterloo. Like, we go where the, where the workforce is. Mm -hmm. But I think bringing people together is still key. And so we haven't found the sweet spot, but I don't think we're in it, in it today. I think we're going to find some kind of hybrid that will hopefully tap into the best of both. And, and, and Sam, what are you learning about uh, distributed work and innovation, helping to, to, to work, come, come up with those great ideas even when people can't physically be together? Uh, I think, um, to the points already made, I, I think it's going to take a while to figure out um, what that looks like in this new world. Um, so I, I've been talking to a bunch of other peers who some have said, uh, I think uh, Google and uh, a couple of other companies have said they're innovating slower and less in the last six months than they ever have before. Uh, but I've talked to a few other companies, CEOs who have said, no, no problem, no problem with us. We, we can continue to innovate and come up with great ideas. Uh, we have to change our process a little bit in order to, to, to pull that off, um, but it hasn't slowed us down. Uh, and, and that might be the nature of the industry, et cetera. Uh, and I know for us, for sure, we haven't found the sweet spot. But I do know that our, we track our employee engagement scores, our uh, ENPS scores, and they're off the charts. They're higher now than they've ever been. Um, when I first started, when I came from Google, where I was used to like a weekly town hall, uh, my employees like, we don't want to see you every week. What are you going to talk about? So every six weeks, I'd get in front and talk to the company. As soon as March 13th hit, they wanted me to talk to them every week. What's going on? How's the company going to keep me safe? Um, how is the company going to get through this? What's the financial situation? Uh, and that hasn't stopped. And so I, I feel more connected and engaged to 500 employees than I did when I could walk around the office. So I, I think you certainly, and, and, and I agree, I, I want to come back to some form of hybrid setup where I can reconnect with employees. I'm now going into the office twice a week just because I personally need that for my own balance, even though there's no one in the office, I'm just by myself. Uh, but I needed that for me. But there's many other, other employees who don't need that. And so I think we're trying to figure out how you can almost choose your own adventure inside the organization to maximize life, uh, while also maximizing pro uh, productivity for the company and continuing to innovate. But I don't think we found the sweet spot, but we're gonna have a lot of time to figure out. I mean, we're gonna be in this situation for a while, I suspect. And what a great proof of concept, beta, alpha, to discover it uh, together. So let's talk about the next uh, the next while, be it three or six months, who knows uh, where, where where this goes. But how are you each thinking about the coming months? It's winter. Uh, the the economy is probably going to be a grind. Uh, the the relief supports may uh, may or may not be there. 
but it's going to be harder in, uh, in different ways and taxing in different ways on our organizations. Let me stay with you, Sam, uh, just to get your thoughts on how you're thinking about the next six months as a leader versus the six months we've just been through. Uh, you're right. So um, our, our big period of time is coming up right now. Holiday time, active weather time, like the, the, the company comes alive when, uh, when we start getting days like this. We have storms, uncertainty. That's when Canadian uh, users or users all over the world come to our platforms to understand what's going on. So the whole company kind of comes alive. Um, however, if you're doing that from home, it's now the winter where you can't get out and go to a restaurant or something and you're kind of locked back in. It will, it will, it will be a challenge for us. Uh, we're gonna bring some folks in during active weather to determine, uh, it's, to do everything that we do. Um, but to points earlier made, there's a, there's a mental health balance that our, our employees are fatigued, they're tired. I can see it, I am. And so I've tried to dial back a little bit of the speed and the push that I'm pushing everyone because at some point I'm just gonna to push too hard. Uh, and as we kind of roll into the winter, which is our busy season, you've got uh, advertising is off the charts in the, in, during the holidays. Um, we're seeing the fatigue with our customers, with our agencies. So everyone's kind of anxious to get back, but at the same time, they're super tired. And so from a leadership perspective or a process perspective, we're, I, I'm just being very mindful about ensuring that I don't push the apple cart too, too far that I upset that balance. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's something that's been on my mind as we enter our busy season. Uh, and, and there's the sense that we're starting to come back, but, but we've been running on fumes from the last six, seven months. And we all need a little bit of time to recharge in order to get us to, that, to our busy season. And I'm trying to find uh, how, to, uh, how to refuel. It, it's, it's difficult. And, and Janet, I'll come back to Dean on this, but uh, this is your busy season as, uh, as well. How, how are you thinking about the challenges of the next six months versus what we've been through and how to manage that? You know what, it's such a good question because I often think about post-secondary education as upstream, right? So we need to deliver um, uh, in, in the face of an economic recovery. And so, you know, for our core business really is programming. What do we offer? And I think uh, you know, what we understand and know is that uh, the care economy and the green economy uh, need programming. And so uh, we're positioning to be responsive in those spaces. Everything, you know, content right now is king. And so if we think about our animation, arts and design faculties, if we think about our uh, health science programming, um, if we think about our business programming in places like supply chain, for example, science and technology, there's programming you know, what we offer, there's what we teach in the curriculum, and that needs to evolve in light of what the pandemic has, I think, unearthed. Um, and then there's pedagogy, the way we teach. And so all of these pieces are moving, uh, all the while responding uh, to a reckoning on race and equity and inclusivity, which, uh, you know, I really think the pandemic has heightened our consciousness about the imperative to do better and to do different. Uh, in the equity uh, and inclusion space. So, uh, you know, the next six months, uh, as I've said, you know, I think in, in different ways previously, uh, you know, the imperative is to use this as an opportunity to move forward on those three fronts, recognizing um, that, that our, our capacity is tempered. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm sure like my, my, my colleagues that, you know, our, our workforce has a tremendous commitment uh, to young people and to, to generating both personal and social outcomes. Um, and there is genuine opportunity at this moment. It, it's trying to figure out how to harness that um, uh, in, in, under the auspices of creativity and, and, uh, and, and innovation. So I'm also really working hard to take cues from my colleagues. And it's amazing what people are coming up with. We're, you know, we're talking about virtual engineering labs virtual productions in music theater, uh, virtual internships. You know, RBC is our number one employer of co-op students. In the absence of those face-to-face -face opportunities, where else can we find uh, uh, chances for students to engage with experiential learning, which we know uh, drives job readiness? Hey, Dean, how are you thinking about the next uh, six months? You mentioned earlier you've got a, a more regulated uh, kind of workplace, but uh, not immune. To, uh, to the yeah. forces outside us? Yeah, so clearly, I mean, the, 
to the extent there's a second wave, and, and, and I think in Canada, uh, the governments have done a great job. I think, you know, as a society, you know, we've been taking care of each other, but, but our supply chain is, is, is global and it's North America wide. So clearly supply chain will be a concern for us in terms of disruption that that may cause. Uh, so we'll be looking closely at that. In terms of the market, I'm quite optimistic. I mean, we've seen the market, it, it, it's fairly strong. We're launching a lot of new products over the next six months. And there's still a lot of activity. I mean, if you want to get some work done on your house right now, good luck, right? And, and, and all those, those guys that are coming to do work on your house are driving Ford F-150s, right? And so there's a lot of, um, cer certainly, there's, there, there's, there's a lot of demand out there um, for our products. On the commercial side, less so uh, in terms of large fleet bids, uh, rental cars, those kinds of things uh, are, are off. But, but I do see that starting to come back. And, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Clearly, we're a large ticket purchase, so we track, I mean, unemployment is, is, an, is an indicator that we watch very closely, right? And I don't think we've really seen, you know, the full impact um, that this pandemic has had, right? As some of the government supports start to fall away, um, some of the impact on small business is, is going to be really tough. Uh, as we see any increase in unemployment, um, that has a very, obviously, a very close um, impact, um, impact on our business in terms of new car sales. So, we're watching all of those elements. I, I think in many ways it's, it's, it's going to be somewhat more challenging almost than the last six months um, because I, I kind of feel like we were all thrown into this and, and, and just kind of day by day, right? Just, just what do we need to do to survive the week? What do we need to do? And, and now it's, it's, it's a bit more of a question mark, I think, in terms of what it's going to look like. Maybe in our last few minutes we can talk about uh, the opportunities for Oakville as a, as a community and what uh, the, the community and leaders uh, should be should be thinking about Sam. Let me uh, start with you. What uh, what do you think Oakville should be thinking its way through for the uh, for the recovery and um, maybe a different normal? Well, um, I live here too. I, I live here and I work here. So um, it, it's such an amazing community. It's very interconnected, uh, and folks kind of lean on one another. Uh, it's it just that's been my six year experience living here, and I think the same needs to happen from a business community. So you had mentioned earlier, I'm getting all my ideas now um, from other folks. There's no work plan for what we're going through. No one has written a book about how to manage through a global pandemic, uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like there are all these things hitting us all at once and we're going through it as leaders and we have to, we have to be vulnerable and we have to make sure that we employees know we don't know all the answers, but at the same time, we, we, we've got we to gotta be there for them. And so um, because there's no, there's no work plan, I'm just looking to all my peers to, to understand how they're doing it and then and building these plans on the fly where I'm getting great ideas. And so that, that might be a proxy for, for businesses to do the same, right? So if, if, if your neighbor, you always relied on your neighbor in Oakville from a business perspective, just start talking. Uh, like all of a sudden the competitors that I, uh, would compete with every day or picking up the phone saying, how are you managing through this particular issue? And, and all the walls come down because everyone is just vulnerable and needs help. And so I'd say the same thing from the business perspective. Be, uh, offer your assistance. If you're, if you're seeing things working, share it with all those around you. If you're th seeing things that aren't working, share it as well. And, um, and then we'll build kind of a, a wisdom of the crowds work plan that might work a little bit better than if we're off all in our silos, um, just you know, hammering away. What a great insight, Dean. What, what, uh, what should Oakville be? I, I agree with Sam. I mean, we've, we've, we're all across the country, but this is our center of gravity here in Oakville. We've been here almost 70 years uh, in this community. And uh, I think working together, talking to each other outside of the categories that we're in is, is key. I, I think of my team and how we continually upskill our team. You know, what are the education models that we could be looking at? How could we, we be working with a, a Sheridan or, you know, other institutions? So I, I think this kind of working together across categories is really exciting because we all have something in common. We're all dealing with, with this, this pandemic, which none of us anticipated. And so I think there's a lot to be learned. I think the, the community supporting each other uh, is, is the answer. Tiana, what would you uh, want well, for the people of Oakville? Uh, you know, so, so Sheridan's mandate uh, in large part is really focused on skilling, upskilling, reskilling. Uh, and we pride ourselves on serving the communities um, uh, of Oakville, Brampton, and Mississauga. And 
You know, our campus here is world renowned. It's the center of creativity in the country. And I think there's just such tremendous opportunity for us to work collectively, collegially, collaboratively around our applied research agenda. We have this amazing talent potential, uh, sometimes untapped, of, of 23,000 students. What can we be doing differently better to ensure that the needs uh, of businesses uh, in Oakville are met? And so demonstrating foresight and then partnering uh, and give us feedback about what you need. That's our job, that's our accountability, and, and we take that very seriously. That's such a great and uh, positive point to end on. Uh, we talk about how this crisis has brought the future forward. We now have a generation that is just primed for this. When we wonder about how, you know, how, how can we work on, on these new platforms or with these technologies, kids coming out of school now, that's their native language. Talent. So the, the more we can rich. give them the challenges, yeah. the more we can do uh, co-ops and work integrated learning, uh, the more we can develop our communities and work with uh, youth everywhere, uh, the better off and the stronger the recovery should be. So thank you for that. Thank you all for uh, spending time with us and, and for your leadership in, in crisis. It's really, uh, really positive. And uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, spent time with us and is working to uh, build back better. Stay safe. Wow, what an incredible program. My name is Drew Redden, President and CEO of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce. Thank you to John Stackhouse, Dr. Janet Morrison, Dean Stoneley, and Sam Sebastian. On behalf of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us and more importantly, for sharing your thoughts. We're living in a critical moment in our global history and I will end this evening by borrowing a quote from Mr. Stackhouse. COVID did not crush the future, it merely brought it forward. And I believe many of the comments made here tonight made this quote really resonate with me, and I hope it did so with our members and for all those watching this program. Once again, thank you to our partners who are such an important component of the Chamber's success. It has been a challenging few months for our business community, but the generosity of our partners has been nothing short of remarkable. The generosity of our partners allow us to continue to support the membership by advocating on their behalf and hosting important conversations like the one we had tonight. A special thanks to RBC Royal Bank, CN Rail, Sheridan College, the Ford Motor Company of Canada, MNP, Euroline Appliances, Kojiko, O'Connor McLeod Hanna, and Watson Investments. I'd also like to recognize our event partners who we cannot recommend enough. Howard Ironworks Printing Museum and Restoration, Gavcom, it's always a pleasure working with Gavin and his team, and Your TV for filming tonight's event. Thank you all for tuning in across Oakville and Halton. Stay safe and we look forward to hosting you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>